All right, hi everyone. Um, this is Mike Stenta, uh, developer of PharmOS. Um, this is the PharmOS monthly call from April 8th, uh, 2020. Um, we're gonna be recording this call because uh, we have a bit of an agenda this time to go over uh, some of the ways that, that a developer or, or someone who is kind of interested in um, modifying or customizing PharmOS and doing some custom development, how they can do those and some of the things that are involved in that. Um, so uh, Nick from Bottle Farm put together an agenda that I'm just gonna walk through and kind of answer those questions as they, uh, as, as I go through them. So I'm kind of approaching this fresh. I, I've sort of skimmed over it, but um, yeah. So we'll go through it one at a time and, and um, Feel free, people, other people on the call to like chime in with other questions and interrupt me at any point. I'm just gonna kind of talk and see how it goes. So I'll share my screen to show this and we'll give it a, give it a go. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll make this a little bit bigger. <clears throat> and I've got, I've got a development, a local development environment set up here. So I've got, uh, an old snapshot of a PharmOS instance here that we can kind of play around with. Um, and I've got the code base opened up in PHP Storm here, which is the uh, IDE that I use. Um, so, so this right here is just kind of a standard, oops, this is just kind of a standard Drupal um, web root right here. Uh, and I'll go, I'll dive into some, some things once we get to that point. But let me start with the document here. So first question, what modules to enable or install to be able to modify? So that's a really good question because uh, Drupal um, and therefore PharmOS uh, has, does a lot of stuff, allows configuring of a lot of stuff through the user interface itself. So you don't even need to use code uh, to do a lot of things. Um, so PharmOS is largely built with uh, with those features um, kind of as much as possible so that we can then export that to code uh, and have it managed to be able to see what's overridden and what's default in the system. So I, I'll show you what that means in a minute, but um, first of all, on the modules page, this is just the Drupal's modules list. So you go to admin slash modules. Uh, you know, there's a there's a ton of modules, and a lot of these are are like Drupal and contrib modules. They're not even specific to PharmOS. All of the PharmOS ones are kind of under these PharmOS groups. So there's kind of the main PharmOS group, which has all the modules that come with PharmOS. Um, then there are uh, PharmOS beta modules. These are ones that are in PharmOS but are kind of designated as beta just to kind of set expectations low <laughs> for them. Um, we also have some deprecated ones that uh, will be removed. Um, so uh, they should be disabled unless you have an older installation. PharmOS contrib, this is kind of what um, we use to, to designate modules that are uh, uh, not included in PharmOS but um, other people provide or that you know the community provides. So these would be things like the beekeeping module, eggs module, maple and mushrooms, the forest module, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I also sometimes create modules for, for certain groups or individuals uh, or individual farms, and I'll put them on in the PharmOS custom group. So uh, you won't see those unless you have those downloaded. But um, so one thing I want to show is that if you're if you're developing PharmOS, when you first install it, it's it's not going to enable a lot of any of the like development modules. And there's a lot of things that that will um, that you can turn on to make development easier. So, for example, all of the lists in PharmOS, like if I go to the plantings list, uh, <clears throat> and bear with me, I'm running probably too many things on my laptop right now. So hopefully this doesn't go too slow. Also, um, oh, here, one, one uh, well, here, two things. So first of all, if you're setting up a local development environment, I would highly recommend using Docker. Uh, you don't have to, but we have a really good guide here for setting up a local um, development environment using Docker. Uh, 
So I would follow that guide. That's what I'm using right now. So to give context. Um, another small thing, real quick tip that I would uh, strongly recommend if you're setting up a local site is to go into admin system, admin config system cron and, and make sure you have this set to never for run cron. Um, this is because Drupal will automatically run cron uh, on page loads if you don't have it set up with your system to run it. And that means that every once in a while or every you know three hours or something, if you reload a page, it'll take a long time and it's because cron is being run for you in the background. So you don't really need that to happen. So turning that off will, will avoid that process. So that's just one small tip. I think we actually have on GitHub, um, on farmos.org, an issue to document. So let me point this out because this is relevant. Uh, development tips. Yeah, document helpful development tips. This is issue number 36. Um, there are a few tips to document. Uh, one of them is turning off the cron one, um, but there's a couple of others in here. I, I'm not gonna go into this in detail. You can check it out. It's issue number 36 on farmos.org. Uh, eventually we should probably move some of this stuff into the actual farmos.org documentation. That's what this is open for. Um, okay, so what was I? I was gonna show some, some modules to enable. So on all of the lists in FarmOS are created with the Drupal views module. So the views module is one of the most awesome things ever. It, it's essentially a, um, a query builder. So it allows you through the Drupal interface, through the UI to build a database query. Uh, and it has a lot of, a lot of uh, features around that basic concept. So all of the lists that you see in FarmOS, all of the asset plantings, animals, beekeeping, almost every one of these menu items up here is defined as a view. So a view is just one configuration for that query. Um, so by default, views has, if I, if I filter the list of modules on, um, in the main modules list, you'll notice there's a views module, but there's also a views UI module. And this is gonna be turned off by default. The views UI module is where you can go to, to customize those views. So you don't need that unless you're, unless you're actively customizing them. I have it turned on here because this is my local development environment, but that will be turned off. So that's one of those modules that you'll wanna turn on. There are a couple of other UI modules like that too, where Drupal and the contrib modules have separated things such that you don't need to have the UI elements turned on on your, on your main deployment. So other examples of that are the field UI module. This is for configuring different fields on entity types, um, which maybe we'll get into. Uh, ignore the open layers stuff because this was all removed in the last release, but they had a similar approach. Um, the feeds, admin UI and feeds tamper admin UI are another example. Those are modules for the CSV importers and for customizing the CSV importers. So you can see I've got those turned on. Uh, one one um, exception to this rule of the UI I, modules is farm UI. Farm UI um, is always turned on. This is kind of a glue module that FarmOS has for kind of creating some consistent interface elements within the system, um, which will probably come up later once we get into kind of customizing some things. So with the views UI module turned on, one of the neat things that you get is you go to one of these pages and you see this little gear right here. If I click on that, it'll say edit view. If I click that, that'll bring me into the views configuration interface for this particular view. And um, so you can see it's a pretty, complicated looking thing at first glance. Um, but let me, let me just show, show the basic principles here. Um, so I'm gonna skip the top part for, the, for, for now, but um, essentially if you look at these different chunks, uh, you have your title, so that gives you the title of the page that's gonna be created. Um, well, okay, so let me, let me talk about the top. So First of all, you can have different kinds of displays. So we're building a query. And what, what we wanna build here is we wanna build a page that lists all, ass, all, all planting assets. So the first thing you do is you kind of create a display up here and you say page. 
So you can see I've got a page here and I've got a data export display. Those are the two displays that are part of this, part of this view, but the page one is all I'm gonna worry about now. And what the page display means or what, what it means that it's a page display is that it's going to have a path. So you can see page settings is in this area. It's gonna have a path at uh, farm slash asset slash planting slash list. You can, this is also where you kind of define the menu item for that. So that's what causes it to show up in this menu right here, as well as permissions to, to access this page path. So right now we have the permission view any planting farm assets, and that grants you access to this page. Um, there's also, you can also customize the header and footer of it. Uh, but over here is like where the, where the real good stuff is. So uh, I said the title already, that's kind of the plantings, it's just plantings. Then what you have is you have a format. So the format has a couple of options for views. Um, for our purposes, we wanna create a page that has a table of results. So we're using the table format. Other things are you could create a calendar format, a grid format, HTML list, jump menu, tree, unformatted list. These are just different ways that it's gonna like output the, the results of this query. So for the most part, everything's a table in FarmOS. We do do a couple of other things, but we use tables a lot. And then you'll have settings for that table. So the, the settings will be things like, um, uh, well, I probably don't need to jump into this right now, but there's some settings for the, for the format itself. The real, the real, good, the real uh, important piece though is fields. So these fields are the columns that will appear in that list. So when you wanna create a view, you come in here and you say, okay, I want to have the farm asset ID and I wanna have a photo and I wanna have the name and the cropper variety and the season and description and flags and that kind of thing. And you can do this all by clicking on UI elements in here, it's really neat. So I could come in here and say, um, you know, let's see what what uh, what other things are on this asset thing. Um, so we could say, okay, when was this asset created? We could add this field, and I can say add and configure fields here, and then it'll give you some options to configure that. So you can say what the label of that column is going to be, uh, what the, and then depending on the type of field, it'll give you options for things. So this is a timestamp field, so it gives me date format options and time zone and a bunch of other stuff. Um, generally, I you know, try to keep defaults as much as possible, and I try to be consistent across all views. So whenever I like decide, oh, you know, I, we, like for example, I, we're gonna be enabling click sorting on all the views. Um, so I, if I do that, I wanna do it across all the views in FarmOS uh, to be consistent. Beyond fields, you then have filters and sorts. So filters and sorts are, are similar. You can add and say, okay, I wanna filter so that it's only showing me planting assets. Um, and that one is, uh, is just hidden. Um, but then you can also have exposed filters and the exposed filters are what actually show up uh, up at the top here. Um, under this uh, filter and sort box, if I open this up. So each one of these is just a, a filter that you can configure in, in, this, uh, in this interface here. Similarly with the sort criteria. So these are, these are default sort options. Uh, right now they're exposed, which means they also show up uh, right here on the sort by. Um, but like I said, we're actually, I'm actually probably gonna be changing this, getting rid of this sort dropdown and just making a bunch of these columns click sortable, so you'd click on the, on the title of it. Uh, this is a feature request that I'm working on. Um, so there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other really uh, complicated things. Basically anything that you can do with an SQL query, you can do with views. Uh, sometimes really advanced stuff would require you writing a custom views handler plugin, which, which would involve writing some PHP code. And then that would give you more options in here. Um, so if this doesn't do something, oftentimes you can write a plugin that, that allows you to do that. And the, the general rule is like, if it's possible with an SQL query, it's possible with views. If it's not possible with an SQL query, it's not possible with views, or you have to find another way to, to work around that. Um, so uh, it might require some knowledge of SQL and the, and the you know, 
abilities and limitations therein, but this is essentially a single SQL query that's being run to generate the results of this view. Um, one other quick tip, and I know I'm probably spending way too much time on just this one, <laughs> on just this one thing, but uh, there's some configuration for in the view settings that will allow you to view the actual query that's being run so that if you want, you can open up a MySQL um, client, uh, you know, outside of Drupal and uh, test out that query outside of views. So sometimes if you're doing like advanced query development and something's not working, you, you might want to show the SQL query. So that's what this is here. So I'll say save configuration. I'll show you what that looks like in here. Um, let me reload this page, I think. And uh, one, one caveat I'll say here, like this looks a little bit weird with all these like green buttons and stuff. Part of this is, the, part of the reason for this is because we're using a custom theme and some of the theme stuff just doesn't look great in this UI. So if this isn't looking good, I would suggest maybe switching to another theme in Drupal. Um, that'll, so you can kind of see what the difference is and where, you know, what it's supposed to look like. Um, but obviously that's a very low priority from FarmOS user's perspective, so I haven't cared about that. So if you look here, this is what that query looks like. It's pretty ginormous, um, and that is because um, uh, it's joining in a lot of different fields um, from, that, from, the, from the planting assets itself, uh, as well as giving ability to get um, you know, these filters working. It's also joining in things like the current location of the planting, which comes from um, logs. So the, the, query, the queries are, uh, can be pretty complicated, uh, depending on what you're doing. There are some much simpler ones too. So that was kind of, um, oh, good. Okay, so I think I, I think I just covered views and what modules to enable and disable. Um, what can be done in UI versus code? I think I covered some of that. Another thing I'll show real quick is entity types. So views gives you the ability to build queries of entities. And entities is a Drupal terminology. Uh, an entity is basically a, a, a um, uh, more uh, strictly defined database record. So um, we have, so Drupal itself comes with some entity types like um, taxonomy terms, which we're using, and users, which are the people, those are entity types. And then FarmOS provides two of its own, uh, assets, farm assets, and logs. Logs is actually a, a separate module, but FarmOS is one of the main users of it. Um, so entities are just, uh, let me open up the MySQL real quick and show you what the database looks like of this. Um, and I'll, I'll caution you against being overwhelmed by the number of tables. A lot of it has to do with just the way that uh, Drupal breaks up entities and fields into separate tables to allow them to be reused across different entity types. Um, but uh, at its very basic level, there's a farm asset table. So let me open up the farm asset table. Um, so this is the primary table for assets. So it, each asset has an ID, it has a name, a type, which would be animal or planting or equipment, um, the, the user ID that created it, created date, change date, and archive date. All the other fields that are attached, that are available on these entities, use Drupal's field API. And the field API, I'll show in a moment, um, uh, similar to views is like a very advanced way of kind of building out data models through the UI. Um, so, but similarly, there's a, so there's a field asset table and there's also a log table. Oops. So similarly, logs uh, have some basic properties on them, which are in the, in the table here but then everything else is on fields. And the fields are uh, specific to the bundle. And the bundle would be like activity, 
observation, um, the different log types. So I'll show that in a second, but these are the basic properties of logs. So yeah, let me jump into real quick. We'll go to manage configuration um, log and log types. So this page will only, well actually no, this, this page will be visible no matter what. But if you see this um, manage fields and manage display links, these will only show up if you have the field UI module enabled. Um, otherwise you can't get into those. But this log types page shows all of the different um, types of logs that are, that are currently defined. So again, log is the entity type. These are, are considered bundles or um, sort of subtypes in a way. Bun the reason they're called bundles is because they're essentially a bundle of fields. Um, so you have your base entity type, which is the log that has a name, a user ID, a timestamp. And then you have bundles that add fields to that. So for example, if we look at, uh, let's look at a seating log. I'm gonna go over here and click manage fields. So within here, you'll see that you have the name, um, you have a planting, which is the asset reference field. Um, you can have your source or supplier, your seed lot number, your notes, your timestamp. And let me, let me actually open up, we'll go to lo localhost, log, add, farm seeding, so that we can jump back and forth here. Close some of these things. So yeah, so first of all, we've got these kind of um, groups on the side here. Those correspond to these. So we've got general, uh, location, equipment, et cetera. And then within that, we've got name, the planting reference, source or supplier, seed lot number, notes, um, flags, category, et cetera. So these are all fields on the, on the entity type. Um, so for example, source and supplier is a really simple one. This is just a text field. Uh, so if I edit that, you'll kind of see what that looks like. So you basically give it a label, source or supplier. You can say whether or not it's required. Um, you can specify the help text right here. So that's exactly what gets showed right here, where were the seeds obtained. Um, and then some other stuff like the size of the text field whether or not text processing is gonna be used for that, um, which I won't really get into. You can also have multi-value fields. So you could say, you know, I want them, the user to be able to enter two values for this or unlimited values, and then you can add more that way. Um, the other really neat thing about field UI is that fields can have different widgets. So a widget is essentially what the, um, what the form itself will look like when you're editing it. So a text field isn't a great example because it only has one option. Let me, let me jump back to another one to give a better example maybe. Um, yeah, okay, the flags one. So if we look at, if we look at this form, uh, see this flags field here where you can, where you can add a flag to, um, to a log. And right now we have priority monitor and needs review. Uh, if I look at this and, and go over to the widget type, there's a couple of different options here. You can either have it be check boxes or ready buttons, or it could be a select list. So I'm just gonna go ahead and change this to a select list. Take a sip of coffee. And then I'll refresh this page. Sorry for the delay, this is taking longer than usual. So now you can see this has changed to a select list. So pretty simple, but it's a powerful concept to, to know about because you, you basically have different 
field types. So there's text fields, there's entity reference fields, there's um, number fields, and then you have widget types. So you can change how, how the user interacts with those fields when they're actually entering data. Um, you also have display types. So that's just the, that, that's when we're looking at this on the editing side. So when I'm up here on, you know, creating a log and I'm editing a log or adding a log. Um, here, let me jump over to an existing log to show the difference there. Um, I'll also go here. So, so then you also can control the display of those fields. And that corresponds to the difference between the view tab and the edit tab when you're looking at a, a log or any any entity. So if we look at this manage display tab, it'll show all those fields again, but then it gives us options for, for how they should display. Um, so let's look at one that's, that's a good one. Um, that makes sense, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I mean, maybe this makes sense. So we have, we have a planting reference field on the seating. So when you're creating a seating, you reference the planting that it is a seating of. Um, or to be more clear, let's use this. So say you're doing a seating and you wanna say what equipment you used when you did the seating. You would use this equipment used field and that would reference an equipment asset. Um, when you're displaying that uh, value, you can either have it display the label of that equipment, or you can have it display just the entity ID. So then it would just be like equipment used 45 or something like that. It's not really useful, but just to give you an idea of the, you know, there's other ways to plugins for this display of each field. Or you could actually render the whole equipment asset right in that display. So you would see the whole thing right in the log. Uh, again, that doesn't really make sense in our context, but that is also possible. So is that how you would display like the map of that, that entity, like where it was? That's a great, great question. Yeah, so let's, um, uh, so actually, no, that's a little bit different. Um, uh, but let me, let me touch on the map one because I think that is a good, a good question uh, in general. Let me jump back to a simpler log type. Let's go to the activity log. And we'll do manage fields or sorry, manage display. So an activity log will have um, the ability to record a, a geometry on it. So you can say, you know, where it took place. Um, so that would be, let's see, down, down here, this geometry field. Uh, so then, you know, you could, this is a great example um, of the, of the possibilities of display types. Uh, so right now we have a custom display type provided by PharmOS that will render the geometry in the PharmOS map. So it'll, it'll actually show an open layers map and render that in the PharmOS map. I could also change it so that it doesn't do that. And instead it just spits out well-known text or GeoJSON or KML um, or things like that. So I could probably demonstrate that super quick here. Uh, so we're just going to say test geometry field, and I'm going to go to location and geometry. Um, so first of all, I mean, the same applies for a widget. If we look at, and I'll open this in a new tab. Uh, if we look at the, the geometry field widget, See, where is that location, geometry? We're also using the PharmOS map widget for that too. So that allows us to say, okay, in order to enter a geometry, we want people to be able to draw it. But, but I could also change that so it requires you to enter in well-known text instead or GeoJSON and you wouldn't see a map at all and you just have to type in or copy and paste that. Uh, but we want people to be able to draw. So, so I'm gonna just draw a quick shape here. I'll say boop, 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 boop. and um, and then save that. Uh, 
Okay, and let me open up that log real quick. So yeah, you can see this on the, so this is what I was talking about, the difference between the view tab and the edit tab here. So view is where you'll see the display plugins for the fields. Edit is where you'll see the widget plugins. Um, so we were just editing when we created that. Now we're viewing and it shows the label. So it says geometry. And you can say whether you want that label to appear above or in line with that. So if we look at, let's see, comparing those. So assign to, we have that set to inline and then we're showing the label. So that's saying who, who it's assigned to and it's showing that all on one line. But geometry, we're putting the label above it. So you can see that right, uh, right here above. And then we're having it show a PharmOS map. So it's taking whatever geometry is stored in the database and sticking it into a, it's rendering it in a PharmOS map. And that's the display plugin that it's using. But if I were to come in here and change this to say, okay, show me GeoJSON instead and save that. bit painful how slow this is but I know that I have some other docker containers running that I should have shut down <laughs> this is really cool to see just like how how farm OS manages a lot of the the different widgets and the fields um, I think I'm gonna have to try try to think about ways I can do similar things in in field kit <laughs> Cool, yeah, and you know, to be honest, like I, this this was the this was a lot of like the early days of setting up things, but a lot more does actually happen in code now. Like this, these kind of UI elements allowed allowed us to kind of really sketch things up very quickly to get up and running. But then once we had some standards in place, it's still just a lot of copying and pasting of code to to repeat those things, um, unless you're building new new log and asset types, which honestly I really don't do that much of anymore um, and try to avoid just to have less to maintain essentially. That's why I always try to encourage like using the existing ones where you can um, unless it becomes really necessary to make a new one. Yeah, well, so, uh, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's a related question from Skipper in the chat room hmm. um, from Riot. He asked, Regarding the columns, can you add columns from another module? So if you had a module that added an extra field to animal records or the animal asset, um, is that possible? And I think that's kind of what you're just saying is you can do some of that from the code. Yeah, yep. So um, if you're talking about the views uh, specifically, yeah, you can have, basically views will give you the ability to add columns to the table for any field that's defined on an entity type. So if you have one module that's that's adding a field to an entity type, that will be available to you in views, uh, no matter where that's coming from. Um, so yeah, yep. The views is really just kind of a, a like I said, a query builder that that leverages the, the structure of the Drupal entity system. Um, so if it's an entity with fields, uh, it's pretty much available to build with in views. And if it's not, you can you can kind of, like I said, kind of write some some views handlers that really just explain to views how where that data lives in the database and how to relate it to other things so that it knows how to build it out. But views is super smart about managing those relationships. And so sometimes like all you have to do is say what the foreign key is on on another table and it'll do everything else for you and, and set it all up which is really cool. Uh, so just finishing this demo here, I'm refreshing this log now after changing it, the geometry field to GeoJSON, which took a really long time to save for some reason. Um, and now this is taking a long time to load. Uh, but yeah, there you go. So now it's spitting out the geometry, no more map. It's giving you GeoJSON instead. So that's just kind of demonstrating the, the way field fields are managed in PharmOS. So, so yeah, we've got the log types, just kind of stepping back again. We've got the log types here. We also have asset types that you can customize. Um, so those are under config, farm, uh, should be under farm asset types, but I think I broke my menu. 
Uh, but it's the same same basic concept. We have um, planting, equipment, animal, sugar bush, all these kind of things. Um, similarly, under structure and taxonomy, we have the taxonomy terms, um, which are also entity types. So this is where you would go to uh, work with the various taxonomies that you, we use. So those would be things like animal species and breeds, crop varieties, uh, log categories, materials that are used for input logs, quantity units. Um, these are entity types also. So if I go to like materials, for example, and click edit vocabulary, you can actually add fields to these terms in the same way. We're not doing that a lot for the most part be, for um, hmm. to kind of keep things simple right now, but that is something that we could start to explore more of. Uh, by default, the taxonomy term will have a name and a description. Um, so those are, that's what we have right now, but we could add additional terms. Now one, or additional fields to terms. One, one, um, exception to this is farm areas. And um, I almost hesitate to really like talk too much about this because uh, farm areas right now are technically taxonomy terms. Um, and this was kind of an early decision because the idea was, well, the location of, a, of an asset is really just kind of a flag to say where it's located. But then we were like, well, okay, we also wanna be able to say what the geometry of that area is. We wanna um, have, uh, displayed on a map um, and then you know dot 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 it became more and more complex and ultimately they they've come to resemble assets in many ways so the the actual plan the on the roadmap is to eventually convert areas to be a type of asset uh, that would open up a few things it would it would just kind of um, consolidate some duplicate code that we have to that is sort of making them act similarly but if you look at areas right now, they are one of the one of the only taxonomy term types that we're using pretty extensively with other fields. So you can add photos and files to areas. You can um, define its geometry on a map. You can flag it and define an area type. Um, so these are these are the fields that are that are on areas currently. Um, yeah. So, but in the in the long term, I'm interested in converting those to assets. Uh, and there's a lot to figure out there, but hopefully that'll be kind of on the near term. So I should probably jump back over here. I've been talking a lot and <laughs> it's already, I think I only got through a couple. Um, okay, using features. So this would be a really good next next step real quick. And I'm just gonna try to touch on this one quickly because I think it'll it'll bring full circle some of the things that I just showed. So features is, um, a really interesting module for Drupal that allows you to build other modules. And you do that, oops. Um, so the history of this is essentially in Drupal, you know, there was all these kind of things coming together that you could configure through the UI, like views and field types and other things. And those were also exportable, which means you could, if I open up localhost, uh, admin, structure, views, um, this will show the full list of views, you can actually export a view to code because it's really just a bunch of configuration uh, that um, that can be represented as, uh, you know, essentially PHP code. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the full list of, of views in FarmOS. OS. Um, so let me pick, pick one real quick. I'll do the uh, farm areas view. So this is the areas list. If I come over here and click export, what this will do is like show me the code that represents this view. And now if you put this in the right place inside a module, that module is essentially providing this, uh, this view. So what features did, um, you know, someone back in 2009 had the bright idea, oh, why don't we make a UI for building modules of exported code? 
so that you could basically go in and say, hey, create a module. I want it to include this view and this set of fields and this, uh, these other pieces of configuration. Uh, da, 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 da. You click a download button and it gives you a tar file with a new module that you can just enable on your site and then it is providing those, um, those configurations. Um, features is both super powerful and the bane of many Drupal 7 developers' existence uh, because it, it has some gotchas. Features eventually um, became the inspiration for Drupal 8's config management system, where now everything in Drupal 8, uh, so again, we're on Drupal 7 for PharmOS, but we're working towards Drupal 8. Everything in Drupal 8 is uh, configure, uh, can be exported as config into YAML files. And they have a really robust config management system that's included in core that really um, made it unnecessary to have features. There still is a features module for Drupal 8, uh, which provides a little bit of helper stuff now um, and the ability to package up modules like that like it used to. Uh, but a lot of the a lot of that idea of being able to export config to code is now part of Drupal core. Um, but this is what the features UI looks like. So a lot of the modules that come with PharmOS are actually just features modules where we've exported that set of configuration to code. And one of the really neat things about that is you can tell whether it's using the code or whether you've overridden it by changing things in the UI. So remember a minute ago when I made some changes to the, I made a few changes. Um, now we can see that the, we can see that those changes are made in this UI. I can see that the farm crop module is currently overridden. I can also see that the activity log is overridden. Um, so let's take a look at that. Let's click on overridden on this farm log ac activity. And we can actually see a diff of what the, of what the difference is here. Um, so the main thing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna gloss over these other ones up here because that's kind of a, one of the gotchas, but uh, one of the main things here is that look, we changed from being um, from using a geo field or for, from using a map to display the the geometry of an activity to using to doing GeoJSON. So we can see that that's here, and now I can come up to this recreate tab and download this new version with those changes included. So I can download this, pop it into my Git repo and see the diff in the Git repo, commit that change, and then it's part of PharmOS. So, you know, I'd come here and I click download feature. And I'll just real quick jump into profiles, farm, modules, farm. And then this one happens to be, I'll just save that there and open that up. So we've got our farm log activity tar file. And if I open that up, I see the farm log activity module that it just created. If I look in there, it's just the, it's just the same module files, but this has the, the changes that we just made. So now let me just drag that into, you have to know where these live to be kind of efficient with this, but over time it becomes um, muscle memory. Uh, but again, I, I don't, actually do all that much of this anymore because um, things are pretty stable. So now if I, if I open Git and look at the changes that were just made, um, okay, so first I'm gonna, there's a couple that I want to ignore and those are the ones that I was mentioning before. So let me, let me just discard those changes. Uh, Oh, oops, I think I discarded the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> um, I ho well, hopefully you get the idea. You, you basically export that to code and then you can, you can commit it to the Git repo. Um, so that's, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just via code. So, you know, if I come into my code editor and say, you know, farm modules, farm, um, let's look at, the, at that activity one, farm log activity. Features puts things into very specific files, and you know if you're if you're if you've done anything in Drupal eight, Drupal eight's a lot better organized. They've got a much better um, because they're they've kind of standardized on the config management system. They have a much better organization thing. But 
you, you get used to this here and you'll, you'll kind of learn where to look. So if we wanted to, for example, make that GeoJSON change, that would be in this file. And so this is the definition of that field, exported field instance uh, for the log entity type, the farm activity bundle, and the fa field farm geo field is the field. So this is where that is all defined. You have the description, um, uh, the display settings, and the widget settings. So those were the two things that I showed before. So that's what it looks like when it's exported to code. And again, features will do all of that for you and, and basically just change the lines that you changed in the UI, which you can then commit, uh, commit to it. Now, um, one, this is a good point to say, and the reason we, I created this uh, page on farmos.org, update safety. So one of, the, one of the risks in making these kinds of changes or modifications is that it could conflict with a future version of FarmOS. So if you, are, if you are making changes and you have these kind of overrides in your features list, um, and then you update to FarmOS and, and it, you update to a new version of FarmOS and it changes one of those things, you could run into issues where you're where you either have to revert your change in order to get the new stuff and then reapply your change, uh, or worse, like there could be there could be bigger issues there. Um, it's hard to explain all the different possibilities, so that's why I just put together this very general page on farmos.org that says, you know, this is great, uh, just be really careful, and um, it would be. Uh, always best to have a development site that you're testing against before you deploy, you know, before you're change before you're deploying your changes. So that if you if you're making changes and you need to update FarmOS, test that update locally first. Uh, generally, you know, all the the updates that I make to FarmOS for new versions and stuff, those updates are all tested to work against the default FarmOS configuration there's no way that I can know if that's gonna break your customizations. Um, so that's just to say, be careful. It's probably not as bad as I'm making it sound, but I want you to be careful. <laughs> um, cool, I'm jumping around a lot. Is this making sense? Is there anything I should circle back on? Um, so I, I covered using features. This is features. real good for me. This is perfect. Great. Okay, great. Uh, so I could jump into creating new asset types and new modules. I'm going to, I just want to quick run over these things, see if there's any, any other quick ones I can do in the UI stuff. I kind of went over taxonomy terms. Do you think that covered what you wanted to see, Nick, generally? Yeah, yeah we're good there. Cool. Uh, modifying the dashboard. I'll talk about that with the modules. Modifying log forms. I think I showed that with the um, field UI stuff. Creating new log forms and types, creating plan types, and adding new flags. Yeah, so a lot of this next stuff is uh, does require some, um, some module work. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to jump into that, but also we, we're at 253. Uh, how is everyone feeling? Um, should we make this into a two-part series? <laughs> uh, or, or do you want me to do like some real quick in the next five minutes um, stuff? I'm fine splitting it into a, a two-part. I think there was a, a lot to learn there. <laughs> get, yeah. get us all started on things and we can wrap back around to it later. Okay, so maybe this one was, we just had a quick focus on what can be done kind of through the UI and a little bit of the, um, a little bit of the features export stuff. Maybe next month we could uh, jump into some of the more module development stuff. Does that make sense? Or, or is there anyone that's like really chomping at the bit to see some of the code? <laughs> I wanted to ask a, a few things about just the, um, the dashboard what is possible to modify the dashboard okay i'm familiar with the the code side of things but um maybe could you just explain visually what is possible with the code without showing the code at yeah, maybe as an intro absolutely. for next month that's a great idea um so let me open up the dashboard and by dashboard you just mean the the home page right or the main yeah. page you get to mm -hmm. yeah um cool yeah so real quick the dashboard is is you know, a single page 
callback that we have in the system that actually allows other modules to add panes to it. Um, and I kind of call them panes, but they're just these boxes. Um, I'll show that in a second. The other thing to note is that you can also add um, tabs to it. And these are just these are just defined as other page callbacks in Drupal's menu system that happen to be uh, also avail de defined as tabs here. So Drupal has a whole menu um, system that says, you know, okay, we've got, uh, well, here, I can even jump in and show like the menus here. Um, so it has, it has like, you know, the farm menu has, uh, I don't know if I should get too deep into this, <laughs> but anyways, you can define a page callback and say, okay, I want, I want this page to appear as a tab. <laughs> that's the, that's the idea. So, um, but panes are, are relatively simple. And this, we can actually jump into a quick, uh, some code real quick. Um, so let me show, we have a farm dashboard module, which itself is pretty simple. Um, all it does is say, uh, okay, we're gonna create this farm path. So farm, you know, slash farm is essentially where the dashboard is located. So if I go to localhost slash farm, that's the exact same thing. Uh, no difference there. It's considered, it's set as the home page. So that's, that's that. Um, but notably, you know, you could go in and override that and say, okay, actually I want the home page to be farm slash areas. Then you wouldn't ever see the dashboard. You just see the areas page. Um, that's just a Drupal setting of like, what page is the home page? Right now, slash farm oh. is the home page. So that's, that's a good way to, to customize. And that's actually what we did on this, um, forest service website, uh, which is kind of like a pretty customized farm OS where we, we said, okay, we want like a very, we, we want to not use the farm OS dashboard at all. And we want to just give it our own dashboard. So we just created a path at slash FMIS and set that as the homepage. So you That's can exactly still what I was asking. <laughs> Great. Okay. So you can still go curious. to slash farm and see this, but they're just not using it at all. If that makes sense. So maybe that answers your question. Um, the other option is that you can add panes to the existing dashboard, and that's just done with a with a a hook. So in Drupal, hooks are really just a function with a special name. So if you create a module and add a function to it that's called my module underscore farm underscore dashboard underscore panes, you can define a set of panes that you want to appear on the dashboard. And so this is just an example one here that says, okay, it's gonna be my pane. Um, and then it has some options there. So you can give it a, at the very simplest, you can just give it a, a callback function and that'll return output that should be put into that pane. So for example, let's look at uh, this metrics pane, I think is a really good example. And Paul is familiar with this one. Um, if we look in the farm metrics module, and in farm metrics dot farm dashboard dot ink, it's implementing that hook. So it's saying farm metrics underscore farm underscore dashboard underscore panes, and it's saying, okay, we want to create a uh, a pane called farm metrics, and give it a title of metrics, and the callback is going to be farm metrics dashboard pane, which is just this function right down here, and all this does is loads up the metrics, iterates through them to build, you know, rendered list items and then outputs it as HTML. So if I wanted to come here and say like output equal uh, dot equals hey all and save that I can come back here and refresh and hey all there it is. So that's a really simple example. Um, you can also do other things where like this is actually a view. The late tasks is actually a view. Uh, so that's defined in the views UI. Um, again, it's just the table of logs with dates uh, and that kind of thing. Have um, HTML as a as a pane. Oh, can could you speak up files? a little bit? I can't quite hear that. Sorry, can you have um, external like an external HTML or just pure HTML code as a uh, as a pane? Uh, yeah, right. So, yep, you could. And that's basically what this output is here. So 
you know, if I come in here and say DPM output, oh, and this is something I didn't really cover, um, but I'll mention it after I show it. Uh, what DPM is, is like just going to print out th that output variable in a, in a little debugging thing here. Um, so yeah, see up here, that's just HTML. That output variable is just a bunch of HTML. And then that pane is returning that, which is then kind of rendering it in the page here. Does that make sense? So if it was something very simple, could I, where it says callback, could I have the callback as just a bit of HTML or does it have to refer to another function? Uh, oh, right. Yeah, no, it does have to re refer to another function. Um, but the function maybe, can return the HTML. Yeah, that's right. So like here, I'll just make a, I'll just copy this real quick and say, boop. Uh, so I just renamed the old one to farm dashboard pane two, and I'll just say return, um, you know, underline, <laughs> uh, hey, and that should work. Oh God, yep. there's a cat here. Okay, and can you, um, could you then put in like an iframe or something in there? Like maybe you want to uh, embed a calendar or? Yeah. Yep. Something I, else like that. Yep. This has because I know if you if you put an iframe into comments or like notes or anything like that, it it won't put it in. Yeah, and the reason for that is well, well so yeah, you can do it here because you're you're working directly with module code. Um, yeah. If you're doing it through comments or notes fields, those go through a, a filtering process. Yeah. To, yeah. To there's prevent... only a few that are approved, are not? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and that's to prevent um, mainly to prevent like you know. Breakouts. Malicious users, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you could you could use iframes in here. Awesome, I love that. I know. Cheers. And there's a lot of places you can do this kind of stuff. Like um, here, let me show one one last thing. Um, think of a good example here. Uh, well, okay, here let's go back to the one that that Jamie brought up earlier. If I go to um, an animal asset. Oh, this is going to be painfully slow. <laughs> um, here, I'll do yeah. this on a I'll do this on a live site because it'll go much faster on an actual server. Okay, so let's find. Let's go to. Uh, do, do we have any animals with location in here? No, of course not. Um, equipment, I think we do. Oops. Yeah, okay, so let's do this uh, This tractor. Okay, so what Jamie asked about is, so see this, see this field over here, geometry, um, and it shows the map here and location. These kind of look like fields, right? Like they look like what I showed before with the field API, but note, assets don't have a geometry field and they don't have a location field. Location and geometry in FarmOS is is defined by movement logs. So you have to create a log that says this asset moved to this place. So in order to get this on this page, essentially we just have a little hook that's saying whenever a asset is being viewed, load up its location from the most recent movement log and print out these things on the asset page itself. So I'll show you what that code looks like. Um, that's in farm movement and I think it's under, hold on. Where did I put that? Oh yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So this is hook entity view alter. So this gets run whenever an entity is being viewed. Uh, and so in this case, we're saying, okay, if this entity is a farm asset, um, generate markup to describe the location and then stick it into this location field. So that, that then gets rendered uh, in, in that spot right there. So, so in other words, like there's a lot of ways that you could add things in different places within FarmOS just by implementing the right hook. Uh, and a lot of this is just Drupal's uh, 
you know, super flexible, customizable, modular uh, approach with, with its hooks. Um, obviously that also, you know, adds complexity in that like, if you're trying to find out where something is coming from, it could be, it could be a little bit difficult, um, but there's ways of doing that with a debugger and things like that. Um, and you can always ask me because I pretty much know the code like the back of my hand at this point. Um, cool. So yeah, I think that's a good good place to to stop for this time. So maybe I'll um, stop the recording and uh, we can pick this up on uh, on next month's call and, and dig a little bit more into those uh, those module things. And one last thing I will say with with this leaving off too is that um, uh, we are working on moving to Drupal 8. And Drupal 8 is going to change some things, but the basic concepts will be the same. So some of the specifics that I might show, and this will probably more relate to next week's call when we look at, or next month's call when we look at code. Um, the code structures might change a bit because like I said, a lot of the config is moving to YAML files rather than this, you know, the weird way that features kind of cobbles things together. Um, but it'll be for the better in a lot of ways. Uh, that's just to say, like, you know, um, prepare to learn. If you're going to do a lot with Drupal 7 and, and stuff like that, prepare to have to, like, relearn a couple things um, along the way. So, you know, I'm hoping that a lot of that stuff, a lot of our migration will happen this year. Um, everything takes longer, though, and there's a lot of other projects happening. So we'll see. Um, the timeline is still kind of uh, up in the air. Um, so let's just say that optimistically, maybe if you wait until next winter to start uh, playing around, like we'll already be there, maybe. <laughs> Big maybe. <laughs> Is Drupal 8 gonna hate Postgres as much as Drupal 7? Great question. Um, I, it's actually my priority to, um, to start testing with Postgres only uh, in the, in the, um, uh, when we're converting to Drupal 8. So in other words, like I'm gonna set up my development environment with Postgres and not MySQL and just start with that. So that'll hopefully answer those questions early on. And if we find that like, okay, there's just too many issues. Um, I'm optimistic though. I think I think it will work work fine. And really the, like the issues that you've discovered, uh, are very, very small pieces that, that we can just refactor as we get to Drupal 8 too. And they're, they're farm OS specific issues. And I think there's only two or three of them that we've identified. Um, so I think largely Drupal already does support Postgres. It's just kind of our additional like uh, complicated things that we, a few complicated things that we've done on top of that. So that is my plan though. I would like for farm OS 2.0 on Drupal 8 to be Postgres first. All right. Um, well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. See you next month.